What's up guys, this is Heiss, and today we are reviewing Railroader. That's right, the game comes out tomorrow, December 7th, but I got an early access key. I'll note that this video is not a sponsored video, but I did get the key for free, and they asked if I would take a look and show it off. All that being said, there was no requirement or contract that I say anything about the game, so I'm allowed to give it my free review. And as such, as many of you know, I am a bit of a stickler for details. I've worked as a full-time signal engineer before, uh, which involved lots and lots of very nitpicky review. I've been in the steam railway industry for 10 years now, and I love this. It's my passion, it's my everything, and I'm a very nitpicky, critiquing reviewer. All that said, I want to try and provide both an unbiased review and a biased review. I'll put chapters down for the video so that you can jump around as you'd like if you want to hear one or the other, but for the unbiased review, I want to review what the game has said it will do, what the advertising says it will do, and then I will review what the game actually delivers before I get into my nitpicky nitty gritty details at the end. Railroader is described on Steam, saying you and your fellow railroaders are the lifeblood of your railroad, just like it is the lifeblood of the community it serves. Switch cars at industries keep people moving while running local passenger trains, and run trains with a purpose in transition era Appalachia in Railroader. And that's all entirely accurate. That's exactly what you do in the game. The gameplay of Railroader is basically focusing on the global railroad operations. Use locomotives to spot cars and industries, and you can also run passenger trains. At the industries, it's primarily switching puzzles, which can be a lot of fun. It's very reminiscent of a model railroad in that way. And it really scratches the logistic puzzle itch. You get given a ton of cars to deal with. Where do they need to go? How do you spot them? Okay, make your switch list and figure it out. You can operate trains in first person, and also with a UI in third person. So you can either sit back and watch the train go from afar, or you can be in the cab. The third person camera in particular is quite brilliant. It's awesome. You can really pilot it around and manipulate things and really take good control from a much broader view than just being stuck in the cab. So I really appreciate that design element of the game. The game is both single player and multiplayer, though I have not gotten a chance to play the multiplayer yet, as there's only so many folks who've gotten early access keys, but I'm excited to try the multiplayer because I think it's going to be brilliant. The single player experience can be a bit monotonous until you get a couple more locomotives. You start with two in the default career mode, and then you can end up buying more as you get money. And when you get about three locomotives, it starts to get really interesting because then you can be managing the railroad as a whole with AI engineers and all of that. The AI engineer helps you a ton. You can say, okay, well, I've put this cut of cars together. Run to the other end of the railroad, please. Okay, cool. Or run to this flare. Run and meet the passenger train that's also run by an AI at this point. Okay, cool. Which is easy enough and simple enough, but it could be improved that the AI engineers don't know how to stop at stations yet, despite all the station locations being known. The AI engineer is smart in that it won't run into other trains, it won't run into buffers at high speed, it won't do anything too crazy on that front. It would seem very simple for a tick box to sit and wait at a station until the passenger cars have unloaded and loaded passengers and just tell the train to go. But as such, you end up managing the train, and uh, if you have the ADHD like I do, uh, you tend to forget and not realize that your train's been sitting there for 30 minutes uh, <laughs> while you're doing a switching puzzle. The game also features quillable whistles, and they're the nicest quillable whistles in a game that's released, though the quality of the specific whistles varies significantly. It seems that the recordings uh, are not necessarily always the best, depending on which whistle you use. The ability to, to quill the whistle from wherever, whenever, with the V key and then going up and down with the mouse 
is pretty nice. You can quill the whistle from third person, in first person, wherever you want from any distance, even if you're not the guy actually running the train and the train's being run by the AI. One of the nicest QOL things in the game is there's this handy UI for air brakes on the cars. You can see how hard the cars are set up with a simple color gradient, whether or not the air is cut in between cars, and whether or not handbrakes are tied. It gives you a really, really good look at what the train is doing in a small, easy to see, simple way. As well, there's also a good sense of progression in the game. If you're playing career mode, you can unlock the map in sections and unlock features in the map piece by piece, so it's not just a, okay, I'm stuck in sandbox and this is all I have, but you also get that sense of progression by getting to get new toys, and you get the good feel of, I've made a bunch of money, I can buy this now. And getting out of the gameplay, I want to talk about the early access portion of things. Originally, the devs said that early access wasn't going to be a thing, but they ended up deciding to release it in early access, and they estimate it's going to be in early access for a year. They've publicly said models and scenery are being worked on and they're not finalized. Their quote is, one of our goals in building Railroader is to make it accessible to people of all levels of knowledge about trains and railroads. While Railroader is very playable, we are still working on developing its company mode and we need your feedback to help iterate on making it challenging, but approachable and fun, the experience we want it to be for old heads and greenhorns alike. Early access will enable players to enjoy the game while we continue building out features, scenery, and buildings along with balancing the game. They also specifically say that the full version versus the early access version will have a richer experience through its expanded features and gameplay loops, a map populated with scenery and buildings, and as well as additional rolling stock. So we can see why the game is in early access, and you can pretty easily understand that. The scenery is pretty sparse, and there's not a lot of buildings in that sort of front. There's locations you need to spot cars for industries, and you may not realize that there's an industry there because there's nothing there. It, you can't tell exactly where you need to spot the car unless you hover over the car's delivery location, and then you can specifically see where someday there shall be a loading dock or something uh, similar once they get done with adding the buildings and scenery to the map, which makes sense, and I think this is a good use case for early access. I'm curious to see what they mean by expanded game features and gameplay loops. They don't seem to elaborate further on that. Um, and asking questions on streams that they've done. It doesn't seem that they're being public with those directions, but hopefully there will be more stuff coming along that front. We'll just have to see. Speaking of early access, what about any bugs? There's a few, not many. Uh, I was honestly impressed for my first 10, 15 hours of gameplay. I've hardly encountered any bugs in the game. The game runs smoothly. Sometimes when you have a lot of cars, the game does lag a little bit, but that is understandable given the amount of assets. The only bugs that I've really encountered haven't been game-breaking. They've just been frustrating and, and usually simply fixable in some way. The biggest one that's come up the most often is sometimes the water tower and the coal tipples don't actually fuel the locomotive. Even if you're spotted perfectly and you click on them, sometimes they just don't work. But usually, respotting or, in worst case, saving and reloading the game fixes that, and then they just work. So, an interesting bug, but not a huge deal. As well, for the audio nerds out there, there's a weird issue with the Doppler effect related to the camera, which I'm sure is a very frustrating one to go chase down, but it leads for hilarious moments like this. Custom flat top five chime, yeah. Oh, that's a neat feature. <laughs> 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 What? Do it again! Uh, the, the Doppler effect doing? intensified. How you doing back there, R2? I'm not sure what's going on there, but... But, but R2-D2 just got thrown by a trebuchet into the sun. They only have... And there was one time that the AI engineer blew past all of the fusees that I put down. I was working on a switching puzzle and then found that my passenger train had run across the map on its own merit without me having done anything, and then I had to back up the train the whole way, and it was quite frustrating. 
But that's only happened once in 15 hours, so not so bad. And you could additionally set switches against the train, and the AI would have a second target to try and focus on. So I think there's going to be protections for it regardless. I think the worst bug I've encountered was this one, where I was trying to compress my train against a buffer to make sure that a car that I was kicking would go past me and not have cause any problems for me. And then my train exploded and became entirely brown and was no longer usable. So, uh, not sure what went on there, but that's definitely a bad one. All that said, Railroader's in a pretty good state. I think it's a decent early access purchase. It's still a fun game to play, and I'm sure with multiplayer, it's going to be a very fun game to play. They've got a long way to go on visuals, scenery, the locomotives, all those sorts of things. That's what they're working on throughout early access. So as the game goes throughout early access, we have to trust the devs and make sure that things just continue to progress and that the game is actually being worked on. It seems like the communication from Adam and his team is pretty solid, though there have been a couple questionable things, such as the devs saying the models are being worked on with no real plan that we can see, and as well also saying things like wheel slip is already in the game, but uh, I've yet to encounter it despite ripping the stick to full over and over and over and over again with many different locomotives. Perhaps there is a different build that is not pushed to the public that is there that has wheel slip, but I haven't run into it and they say it's there. So hopefully that is just some weird interface between community and testing versions or something and not the devs lying. If they end up being more that way, early access is a less of a good look, but it seems like that's not the case and there's just some sort of clerical error as to why we're not seeing those things. Well, that concludes my unbiased review, trying to objectively score the game and how it's done as nicely as I can without putting any of my opinions and spin on the game. So now it's time for my biased review. As I said, once again, and I will remind once again, I designed signal systems for trains that involved extremely detailed reviews and very nitpicky comments for several years of my life. I did that. I'm a nitpicky person, I'm an opinionated person, I'm also part of a development team that's making a train game, so I'm familiar with the game dev side of things, I'm familiar with the back end of things, it's a different game engine, but the process is still vaguely the same. So I'm opinionated, I know these things, I've experienced a lot of these things on the back end, and I've been a part of the steamroading industry for 10 years now. So I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt, as it were. So with that said, here's my biased review. First and foremost, most of the whistles are garbage in this game. Yes, the quilling is nice. Yes, the slider for the quilling, uh, wherever you want with pressing a keyboard key is a neat feature, but most of the whistles just sound bad. That There's a list, look at how many whistles there are, and I really only like two of them. There's maybe three or four total that don't sound awful, but they're really just not great. And then the quill, the quill range is too big, and the sound is bad. The whistles do not accurately quill like a real whistle would, which, of course, again, very opinionated. This is very much my passion, very much my thing, and I've developed kit to get around that because it's important to me. Is it important for this game? Not necessarily. And there are two that sound nice and feel good, even though they're inaccurate. So... We can live with it. And then there's the other sounds. The whistles are one thing, but the chuff sounds are just phoned in. They're worse than the ones for Microsoft Train Simulator, which came out in 2001. Uh, okay, like, that's not the focus of the game, but you wanted to have nice looking and sounding trains, right? Well, eh, maybe, I guess. And then the smoke and steam just... I mean, it's cotton balls, and it doesn't make sense, and at 10 miles an hour, it goes from individual chuffs to just a plume that's just constant, and it doesn't change with how hard the engine works, and okay, well, none of it's very good or very accurate to anything, which is frustrating, but I guess, you know, at the same time, not the point of the game. The tutorial for the game exists. It is too much information at once, and it doesn't really teach you anything important about the game and how it's actually played. It doesn't teach you the most important things, and, there, and there's no easy way to learn what things are. It, it, it's quite frustrating. It teaches you a little bit about re-railing and running locomotives and moving trains, 
but it's way too much information at once. And it doesn't give you the best quality of life features. The most I've learned about the game that's made the game the most fun, I learned by playing with members of the testing team watching me on stream. And they were able to provide additional feedback. And it's like, well, why wasn't this in the tutorial? What do you mean? Why wasn't this noted anywhere? It's a little goofy in that respect. Speaking of things that are too much all at once, the menus in this game suck. There are too many menus that don't do anything for you. And then there is the God menu, which has too much crap in it all at once. And there's not any color coding. There's not any way to break it down. You pull up the menu and I only have a small portion of the map unlocked. And this is how big the locations menu is. This is where the bread and butter of everything happens. And it's already an anxiety attack every time you open it. You have to open it to get contracts, to get new cars. It's a critical piece of the game, but you don't know where the hell anything is. It doesn't make any sense. There's no color coding. On that front, when you press tab, you get these helpful UIs above the train cars. However, you don't know where the locations are. Just, it would be so simple to make the tab mode also highlight all of the spurs and spotting locations and say which ones are which, because you don't remember where you are. You don't know the names of the towns, it takes hours and hours to get used to them. So you don't even know where to look in the locations menu to find where this car needs to go. Although you can hover over the car's delivery location and then it highlights it. But if you're not in the right place, that's not helpful whatsoever. You already have a tab overlay mode. Make it tell you about the track. Simple enough. I think my biggest reservation about Railroader is that it falls into the same pitfall that most train simulators fall into. It is stare at crappy digital scenery simulator. The switching is fun. There have been genuine, hilarious, great moments while switching. But unfortunately, there's miles and miles and miles and miles of mainline to run. 60 miles of map. That's gotta be awesome, right? Well, all right, here we are at Wilmot. Little station right here. And we've got a little bit to go to Barkers, then Cowie, Dillsborough, Silva. I have uh, enough of the map that the interchange past Silva is the end of my map. And as we work our way this way, Ella is the other end. I haven't unlocked the rest of the map, which is considerable. Uh, so distances like Wilmot to Barkers are very, very small comparatively. So, um... It may not be the smallest thing on the map. Maybe Dillsborough to Silva might be smaller, but this is a very short amount of runtime on the railroad, and everything else is going to be a little bit on the bigger end, especially something like Wesser to Nantahala. Goodness. Yeah. So anyway, uh, let's highball off, and let's go see what we can see while we run between these two locations now that we've picked up our passengers.
Welcome to Digital Scenery Simulator, my friends. So I've been running now without having touched a control but the throttle once from Wilmot to here. It's about three miles. Haven't done anything. Haven't changed anything. Nothing's happened. There's been no new scenery to look at. As such, with the mainline run as it is, train operations are just boring unless you're switching. What did they want this game to be? It feels like a bizarre mixture of wanting to be a simulator, but also trying to just manage the whole railroad, and it ends up not really doing either that well. The trains are boring. The trains aren't fun to run. They've modeled controls for the air brakes, for the automatic and the independent, and they've modeled the Johnson bar and throttle, but the Johnson bar is entirely wrong. It does not do anything that a real Johnson bar does on a locomotive. Do you guys know that this engine does 16 mile an hour with the bar far in the corner? 16, some change. Let me hook it up, see if anything... Oh, 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 yes. Right, the Johnson bar does things. Oh, man. Hey, we're still chuffing. It's like giving a car two left turn signals and no right turn signal and saying, but it has turn signals. Yeah, but they don't work with the intent of what it should be doing. So why'd you put it in there in the first place? Just give me a knob that goes forward back. Give me a, give me a model train set controller. That would be better than giving this fake version of set it in this location and forget it. It doesn't change the, the water consumption. It doesn't change anything other than speed entirely incorrectly. And uh, my tender's now almost out of water because the throttle's been open for a bit. Shut the throttle. The water does not get used, which is uh, pretty good, pretty accurate. Obviously, there's no fire boiling the water that's in the uh, boiler, so we don't need to add any more because there's no fire, there's no water. Right, uh, although the thing did say that there's yellow in there, so uh, okay. Maybe, uh, I don't know why the water's not boiling. Uh, let's see, put the bar in the corner. It's wide open. And the water is dropping quite a bit. And we tighten it up. More efficient running. And the water is still dropping quite a bit. Cool. So the thing that saves water, the efficiency of the valve gear, of the locomotive that is not animated in any way, Radius rod should be doing a thing. Um, that also does nothing to save the economy of water for the locomotive. And then the air brakes. Forgiving the Bluetooth air brake stands because the models are being worked on, quote unquote. Uh, we'll just have to see. And I, I probably will do a separate video just about the models because the amount of things that are just egregiously incorrect about the models is very frustrating to me as somebody who actually works on Steam, but that's a whole nother conversation and they're working on it. So I will take the devs at their word on that. But thinking of the air brakes themselves, you're given an independent brake and it goes up to 72 PSI, which is the wrong number. That is a very common setting for a modern diesel locomotive's independent brake. If you have single class brake rigging on a diesel, 72 PSI is right. But these are steam locomotives. The diesels in the game have dual clasp brake rigging. 72 PSI is just wrong. You picked a very specific number and it's just the wrong number. Why did you choose to do that? Why not just say on off? It feels confusing. Do you want to care about the operations of the train or not? Because some thought was given to it, but not enough. So why did you include it at all? And then the automatic brake you are given direct control over the brake pipe and what pressure it is, which doesn't make any sense and doesn't feel right in any way, shape, or form. The cars do not brake like a real car or a real train would brake. Five PSI is a great service reduction and does nothing. You have to make the brake set go deeper than would cause every piece of rolling stock I've ever operated with to slide its wheels and slide them flat for the brakes to feel like it's doing anything. And the operational complexity of using a non-self-lapping brake system isn't there. 
So why did you just give a brake pipe control? Like, honest to God, why didn't we just get a, hey, set speed or do this or do that? Because it doesn't really matter if you're handling the train poorly. There's no downside to handling the train poorly. So we can bail the engine and off, and that's a realistic thing that you really have to do, but it doesn't get you anything. So why is it there? There's no bonus to handling the train correctly in this game. But they tried to simulate parts of that, but haven't hit the mark. The frustrating thing alongside all this is that running on the main is just intrinsically boring. Set it and forget it. If they had actually modeled these things in some amount of way where you're actually operating the locomotive like a real one, it would be significantly more interesting. But no, instead they decided to make the water sight glass show you how much water is in the tender. Which is really helpful if you ever played the game in the first person UI, but the controls are so bad, and the hitboxes on any of the controls are so bad, that you're never going to spend any time in the cab unless you just want the feeling of sitting in the cab and doing the thing. It's not fun to run sitting in the cab. It feels bad. You have to look at the sky to use the whistle, and then it still does not behave like you'd want it to. So there's no reason for you to stare at the sight glass that's telling you the wrong thing until you accidentally run your engines out of water or coal or something. The fuel usage is so removed from everything that you're doing, it's just a model train flavor text MacGuffin. Oh, you need coal for the train to work, you need water for the train to work. And you're removed from any action of utilizing it in any way that it's significantly easy to run out, especially if the engine has become brown, because broken trains are brown. Which, to be fair, it is challenging to make a locomotive look like it has been worn out or used or abused in any other way. So I think it's a fine mechanic to show off that the locomotive is in a bad state easily just by seeing how brown it has become. But when you get there, the locomotive no longer brakes with any semblance of power or anything like that, and the fuel usage seems to skyrocket. I actually soft-locked my first save by running out of coal because I went around a curve fast enough that the engine became brown enough that it just would use too much fuel, and then it ran out of coal, and the other engine wasn't in the shop yet to be fixed, so I had no more locomotives. And the game provides you no recourse if that happens, so good luck, start over. And beyond that, the balance isn't really there yet in the career mode, which they have said is new, and that's part of the early accesses they desire feedback for that, which is absolutely fair. That's definitely understandable. You get paid something like 60 or $70 per car when you spot cars, bring them back to the interchange, and then if you've damaged the cars, that money amount goes down. But everything is significantly expensive, which means that it takes a lot of loans to really get anywhere, and then you have to play for a significant amount of time as a single player to really progress and make anything happen. So it's a little challenging in that regard. The other additional thing there is that it's very neat for the sake of simulating a real railroad that you have to spot cars, leave them at industries, and they take a while to unload. That's a neat mechanic, but there's no way to tell when the car's gonna be unloaded, which I suppose is probably true in real life, but I don't think cars take days upon days upon days to unload, even at a small industry. You're wasting the railroad's time wasting that time trying to unload the car. That a tank car that I spotted on the first day and it's like halfway unloaded at five or six days in to gameplay. J just tell us when the car is going to be ready so I don't have to go on each new day and scroll across the entire map and go, okay, what cars are ready to be picked up? Because, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe there's something in the 15,000 menus that are way too long and convoluted that tells me that. But the tutorial didn't say that. I haven't been able to find it. So it's just easier to look at every location on the map manually and see if the car is ready to go back to interchange or not which doesn't feel good it doesn't feel smooth tell me when the cars are ready say at the beginning of a day hey these cars are ready to be picked up or this car will be ready tomorrow where is that quality of life why do i have to manually go through and check everything maybe that's accurate to the real railroad but that's not fun gameplay of course, then there's the models of the locomotives and rolling stock and everything like that, which 
it deserves its own video because uh, the amount of cockatoo sounds going through my head right now as I stare at this is significant. All that said, I really do think that this is an enjoyable game. I think it's got a really good base. It seems that the dev team cares and really wants to make a good game and that they're committed to it. We'll have to see how things go and progress throughout early access. That's going to tell us a lot whether the devs are just looking to pump and dump this thing or if they're actually going to continue upgrading it and making it a good game. But as it sits, it is a fun experience right now. Switching is genuinely a ton of fun, even if running on the main is the most boring thing that's ever happened in a train simulator. To sum it all up, this game's name shouldn't be Railroader. It should be Model Railroader. That is exactly what this game feels like. This game feels like I've gone to my buddy's house, he's got a model railroad that he's working on, and it's got switching puzzles built into it that are just fun to operate, and it's fun to swap railroad stories, chat with your friends, and the amount of fun you have is based on your friends being there, not the railroad itself. And the, the challenge is, unlike a real model railroad, that takes years to develop and, and be made, and there's passion and love put into every inch of it to make it beautiful, this game doesn't have those years yet. There's still more scenery to come, and it's really boring uh, when you get out there in the middle of river, river tree track, river tree track land. So all that said, would I recommend you get Railroader? I, I would say so. I think it's fun. I think it's going to be a great game someday. Right now, it's pretty fun. And I bet the multiplayer is excellent when you get to hang out with friends and actually have more progression by having more people. But the single player is a little bit challenging and a little bit boring in many ways too. So it's a mixed bag, but for train games out there, uh, it's got stable multiplayer. So it steps over the bar. There you go, friends. Anyways, guys, I hope you like this. I hope you enjoyed both the unbiased and biased reviews. And remember that I am a very nitpicky, detail-oriented person, and you'll probably have a lot more fun than I do because of that. So thank you all for watching. We'll catch you all next time.